First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn how to use the parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. Rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of Roy and Whisker. She's making us do all the work. Yeah. <laughs> it's Super so cool. easy. Hey. <laughs> so basically the idea here for those of you who are just tuning in this week for the first time is that uh, Eddie asks us questions that she has about uh, the propeller, first spin, related topics, whatever, and we do our best to explain them in such a way that not only does she get an answer, but she's put on a good uh, uh, track to not only learning uh, how to do this stuff, but learn how to do it really, really well. Right. Yeah, sometimes it takes five or six times of us answering before she gets it, but she's kind of sure slow. She gets Repetition, it, you know, helps for the noob. Well, for me, <laughs> so yeah, honestly, this stuff's really complicated, uh, especially if you if you're not familiar at all with it. And Addie is not familiar with this stuff at all, so <laughs> it's it. I mean, it's a good thing because you know it's a nice blank slate to work with. Uh, she doesn't have any of the preconceptions that somebody who knows another pro programming language would have. Right. Uh, so that that does make some things easier. Right. Well, I would hope that it's not completely blank right now. After so many episodes of explaining, it's got a little bit of stuff on it. Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit of. She's gonna have fun trying to learn C later on. She's gonna be like, "What? You can't do a DIRA?" Ah. <laughs> uh... Later, later. <laughs> I gotta figure out spin first. All right. So last week we, um, I got some homework, and we were talking through the Cogram map, uh, through the special purpose registers, and we had started talking about DIRA and my program with my LEDs turning on and off. So the the um, special purpose uh, spots in uh, are basically memory in each one of the cogs, and by reading or writing. Uh, to this, these special places, you can do um, things like turn LEDs on and off, mm -hmm. or know how long it's been since something has happened, uh, etc. There's lots of lots of them, and Eddie's just asking us details on all of them. Yes, right. I know you enjoy it, Whisker. Uh, okay, so um, I wanted to clarify this because we had talked. I had asked if you could. Um, DIR, like set uh, specific pins as outputs. Uh, like, say, so for if you wanted to set pin zero to seven as outputs, what you would write is DIRA square brackets zero to zero dot dot seven uh, close square brackets tilde tilde. And that would set all of those pins as outputs. But I wanted to see if you could set like pins two, four, and six um, to be outputs. Now, Roy, could you do that with like uh, by oaring it to a mask or something? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's... Well, there's a couple. There's a couple even easier ways to do it in uh, spin. So, if uh, Addy, if you go down to page uh, 105 in yep. the manual, I am there. Um, you can see right in the middle of the page there. It has a dir a colon equals percent, and then a whole bunch of zeros and ones. Yep. Um, percent means binary number in spin. Yep. And so that's a 32 bit binary number there where it's got 32 zeros and ones, one for each uh, bit in the Dur A register, which equates to one for each pin in the Dur A register okay. in, on the IO pins. So, so one second. You could, you could. I explained this to you last week. I don't know if you got it though. Well, and then I. Because you guys are using a lot of big words like right. like like binary and 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 binary masks. You yeah, know, we are not that. at a ball, a masquerade. Right. We so a I don't even know number. what a mask is. So a binary number, one is true, zero is false. Right. Right? And and when you count in binary, you only have two digits, zero and one. Right. And so by stringing them along in a known fashion, you can represent a whole crap ton of numbers. Yeah, right. but here it's not really being used that way. I, it is, right. but you're, you, you're, you're not thinking of it that way as the human metaphor thing. You're thinking of it as a bunch of on and off switches. Right. right. So, so 
So the the parallax propeller chip has thirty two general I/O pins. Uh huh. What? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And if you want to set, if you want to be able to set all of them on or off specifically, you can do this via binary, which is this one zero thing, by putting DIRA equals percent percent to represent that you're gonna deter- say that this is a binary system that we're working with and then for every pin which is 32 for every pin you have a number either zero or one if you set that pin as zero then that pin is off is an Uh, input i guess yeah an input if you set it as a one it is an output an output so if you wanted like pin zero through eight as on but the rest of them off you would do DIRA percent one 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 no, one. No, no, no. What? Uh, it's uh, just to clarify. When you do a binary number, the bits are in the order where they go from right to left. Oh. So the 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 first Dang it. bit is the one all the way over on the right. What? what so you, you would have. Bit? So when you want to do your example, all the way on the right. Oh, so right. it's going backwards. It's, it, it, no, we're not going backwards. It's exactly the same as base ten or decimal, whatever you you know normally oh, use. It's I the see. same. The lowest, um, uh, the least significant digit is all the way over on the right hand side. Oh, I, I, okay. So it's not backwards. Right. Okay, okay, okay. It's the I same. It. I get. It. So it'd right. be. It'd be uh let's see, thirty two minus eight is what, twenty four? So it'd be twenty four zeros and then and eight, eight ones, ones. for right. setting pin zero through seven as on. There you go. Okay. Right. So that's one example. And then another and that's on page one oh five of the I wanna I, I definitely wanna cover one very important thing right here. What? The example that you just gave is to set all thirty two of them at once with binary. This binary trick will work with your um your pin whatever to pin whatever trick using the dot dot so if you want to set pins 0 through 7 so you go d i r a bracket or bracket and then 0 dot dot 7 close bracket colon equals and then a percent to say binary mm-hmm. and then eight ones and zeros that works too. Well, you just right. jumped the gun. And that was what we were going to get to <laughs> on the next the next page in the manual, page 106 he, covers that exact Whis- Whisker just jumped the gun. Well, and it you could know, be any number of bits you could do I don't, two I'm bits. I'm not looking at the manual. 15 bits. Right. So, if I wanted to so going back to my original example, if I wanted to set uh a 246 as outputs, right. I do DIR two dot dot six equals percent and then like one zero one or zero one zero one zero one or something like that no one zero one zero one zero just be one zero one zero one because you're specifying six through two two through six so So you only need to specify those five bits yep you're right you're right now what happens if you accidentally like give extra numbers like i just did um, you would end up with the wrong value because uh, the the if you put in an extra digit on there, yeah, the it's only going to read the bottom five of those. Oh, and I see. Sign it, so you would be offset, and it would give you the wrong results. Your program wouldn't work at all. I see. So I remember, guys. Uh, it's depends on which side you added it's your from extra right to left. your extra numbers to. Right from right to left. If you added them to the left side, it's not going to change a damn thing. Right. Okay. But if you add extra digits onto the right side, it's going to change what pins are on and off. I always add a bunch of extra digits onto uh, the side (laughs) just to confuse Roy. Okay. All right, we're back to page 23. Right. We're back to page... Are you you guys still distracted? I'm on a roll, a learning roll here, a learning spin here. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we figured out DIRA. We we skipped uh in A. Right. I think. So we, we should probably go back to that here. Right. Right. So in A is just saying that you want to put into a pin a certain value. No. no. 
Oh. NA is reading in. See now, see how it says read only there next to it? Yes. You're reading the value of the I.O. pins. So if a pin is set to an input and you've got a switch attached to it and you wanted to see if the switch was pressed, you're going to use NA to read that. Right. There's a lot of other things that you can use NA for. Like if you have a uh, pin switch to an output mm -hmm. and you set it to high or low with uh, uh, your cog to remember something and then you can use NA to read what it's currently set to. So like one cog sets it as out A, another cog reads it as NA. Yeah. Or, you... or even the same cog. Yeah. Well, that's awfully... Yeah, so there's that's, a couple little, a little useful things you could use it for, but tricky. You know, you mostly keep your... I think what you'll probably be using it for out of the gate here is just to do stuff like read switches or talk to uh, things over serial and whatnot. So that now that's only like a single switch. Mm -hmm. Now, what if I wanted to read the position of a switch? You know, so like you had... like a clicky switch, and it maybe it could go to like three different, like low, medium, high. Right. Well, you know, that's that... more than one switch. Oh, so that goes right. to three different pins. Electrically, that's more than one switch. Okay, but right. that, then that goes to so three different pins. Multiple pins on the oh. input, so you oh. would read multiple input pins. So then it's like get the values as separate bits okay. in that value that you read. I don't Eyes. think I'm really up to explaining quadrature encoders to Addy today. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a complicated. A, co a too complicated name for something that's simple. Well, right. And it's true, Qua but... Really, uh, quadrature encoders? Oh, Do well, they come when, up with when an you, easier Once you understand how they work, the name makes a lot of sense. Right. It's like because a quadratic it's, equation. Well, it's, it's about flipping, you know, the... You said you wouldn't talk about it. I, yeah, I know. Right. I'm just saying. <laughs> we'll, we'll actually eventually get you using a quadrature encoder, and then we'll explain it to you then. Okay, sounds yeah. good. And thankfully, I've written my own drivers for quadrature encoders, so okay, you know, I'll be yeah. able to walk you through it uh, very detailed. Okay, uh, so in a and then out a. Okay, so we pretty much already went over out a. It's how you would, uh, when you set a a pin to an output with the dir a, out a is how you set it high or low, and you've already done that a bunch in your LED programs. And we've talked about the uh, the fact that they're. Um, what what do we say? They were anded. No, they're ORed together. ORed. There you go. Right. They're ORed together in the actual circuitry. So, so anytime if a pin For, is that was weeks and weeks dubbed ago dubbed one by anybody, then it is a one. Yeah, by, by any, any cog. Any, any cog. cog yeah. Right. So if you have multiple cogs using the same pin, if any one of them sets it high, it will be high. Right. And uh, let's let's make sure that we're we're clear here, Addy. The same tricks that you can use for addressing individual uh, pins with in A, or, or with uh, with dir A, mm -hmm. apply to in A and without A as well. So you can turn more than one pin on and off at a time in a single line. You can read more than one pin. Uh, at a single time, and this gets extremely useful. This is one of the coolest things that I, I just think it's uh, I think it's great because you can do things like on your demo board. You've got those eight LEDs that you can turn on and off. Yep, they're on pins what sixteen, 16 through twenty four on the old demo board. Yeah, something like okay, that. yeah, sixteen through twenty three. You say yeah. Okay, so basically, what you can do is you can go out a bracket mm -hmm. 16 dot dot 23 close bracket colon equals and then any 8-bit number right so any number between 0 and 255 mm -hmm. and it will print that <laughs> binary wise onto those so right. you know 255 is one 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 mm -hmm. so that by printing a 255 over the top of that area in the register, you will turn all eight LEDs on. So when I'm debugging code, 
I'll often use those eight LEDs on the demo board as a debug display to print numbers in binary so that I can see what numbers it's dealing with in the code right there on those lights. She's looking at me like I'm crazy. Right. Pretty much. Well, the, well, the other way to think about it is like we described earlier, you can actually do the binary number, the percent with one, zero, one, one, zero, however many, you know, up to eight for the eight LEDs on there. And you can turn them on and off all in one line hmm. on the program. You don't have to do individual out A for each LED. And of course, oh, that binary number is the same as, you know, a decimal number that you're used to. So if you were to take that binary number and just convert it into a base 10 number like you've used your whole life, it still works the same way as the binary number would. For turning on and off the pins, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. I'll have to look at my old code to see to see how I did. Because I know that one of the issues that I came across was that um, I like I didn't know that I could, well, I don't know if I, I, I was completely aware that I could turn a bunch of pins on at the same time, but I knew that um, if I put, like, instructions for one pin after instructions for another pin, that I would have to wait for that other pin to turn on. You know what I mean? Like, right. I would have to wait. It, it would have to wait its turn. It couldn't do it instantaneously. Yeah, there'd be, because so, you're writing in spin, there would be a very small delay from one to the next turning right. on. Right, so um, I mean, now that I know that I I can do this all at once, then yeah, I'll make your code good. a lot shorter too. Yeah, well, right. yeah, I mean, some of my codes are like what thirty some lines just because I'm busy turning LEDs on and off. But like I said, if I can do those all at once, then that'll make it easier. Uh huh. Right. I see. Okay. So, uh, uh, when we were when we were trying to answer you about DIRA. Um, uh, we brought up the fact that you could, you could take a binary number and or it against the value that was already in, uh, DIRA, and the the result would you know change it. And I know you don't really understand that yet, but for those of you out there who do, you can use that trick here as well. Uh, so if you want to change all thirty two at the same time, but you don't necessarily want to change all of them right now this particular command, you can do that here by just oring in there. And what, what, Addie's looking at me confused, so I'll just move on here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. It's just, it's just a Boolean math or operation there. Okay. We're, we're really basically going to end up having to teach her a little bit of binary and Meh. Boolean stuff. Meh. She's making noises, but once she gets it, she realizes it's not really very complicated. It's, you know, just yeah. a bunch of truth tables. It's called instead of 255 being 1111. What, what, let me count how many ones. 1111. One, 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 one. It's just 255. Surprise. Surprise. Right. It only takes three but it's, numbers. It's really handy when you're doing programming <laughs> to be familiar with Boolean math and with binary numbers. A computer only knows binary. Two digits so all right you know to deal with a computer it's very useful and you know that's not even true uh, there are computers out there that know three uh trinary based computers but uh let's get back yeah. to spin really uncommon you guys tangent so, police tangent so back, police back to page 23 here <laughs> c-t-r-a uh, the, the next set of all the all the rest of the registers uh -huh. are uh most of which are used for the counter A and counter B stuff that we covered a few uh, weeks ago. Okay. Uh, basically, these are the registers where you can configure how those counters work, and the frequency and the phase are additional parameters in how they operate. Oh. Um, so the control, we can go into more detail when we actually do an example that uses these. Sure. But uh, basically, the your control register is configuring how it works, like whether it triggers on, you know, a pin going high or a pin going low and stuff like that, and which pin it listens to to count. Okay. And then uh, the frequency and phase are just used for, you know, how how much to increment and and the stuff like that. It's a little more advanced stuff like we talked about a while ago that can be done. 
and we'll cover that in more detail. And then the last two there, the VCFG and the VSCL are for configuring the video output stuff that we talked about okay. a few episodes ago also. And I imagine that and, if if we were to look these right. uh, up specifically, we'd see all the different tables involved and and right. modes and all that stuff. Right. Okay. And again, when we get to an example where we're going to use a counter, which will probably be in a few episodes from now, then we'll go over these in, in more explicit detail, explaining what to set in each register to get the result we want. Okay. So what you mostly need to pull out of the table there is that these are addresses in uh, cog memory, and you can interface directly to them with your code to do all sorts of special things. Mm. Right. And I think it's interesting so that each cog has this in it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, uh, what is that? The You've got eight of them. Not mutually exclusive. It's common common memory well, or whatever, well, kind of. The, the common stuff is really just the counter and then the in, out, and direction registers. Those are common to all the cogs. Okay. The counters, each one has their own set of counters. They're not right. sharing. Their own set of video configuration stuff. So they aren't common. They're uh yeah, okay. Okay, I get it. I get right? it. Yep, 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 yep. Cool. So Okay. So then each cog can have different Well, like I mean, I guess never mind. That was a dumb question. <laughs> no, it's not. I a mean dumb a dumb question. a dumb question that I never asked, but yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, each cog can have its own counter configuration and each cog could be driving a different video display if you physically had eight different displays plugged in to the IO pins cool. using up all the IO pins you could drive all eight of them one from each cog cog wars or like <laughs> like uh, me I use uh, uh, SID cog to generate uh, musical tones and I can have you know so many on each cog but then I go on different cogs to get more and more of them so right. I'll be running you know for SID cogs in different cogs, and I get a lot more voices that way because I can make better use of these kinds of resources. Right. The SID cog is using these counter uh, registers to drive the pulse width modulation output to produce sound. Gotcha. Okay. We can go on to the next thing. I think I'm comfortable with that. Uh, okay. So each special purpose register may be accessed via. It's physical register address, which I imagine is the complicated dollar sign. Yeah, that's hexadecimal something. address. Uh, you can also use the decimal version of those numbers, but those hexadecimal is typically what's used. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's let me. Uh, so, for instance, if I'll I have wanted to. Teach to... Eddie hex. Nope. Yeah. Nope, yeah. Nope. nope. You'll need to know it. Nope. I think it's outside the scope of the show, but I think I'm definitely going to have to teach Addy binary and hexadecimal. Nope. Okay, they're so... Easy. They're very this, easy. Addy is asking the questions here, determining the content. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when I set uh, pin 16, for instance, to tilde tilde, right? D-I-R-A 16 tilde tilde. I can also say do uh, dollar sign 1F6. 16 tilde tilde no that's that's only in propeller assembly can you use those specific oh. addresses directly okay then you in in spin you have to use either the name which is listed there yep in the name column yep or there's a command in spin called spr which is special purpose register um and then index of 0 to 15 which is these 15 special purpose registers so you could use that instead well, that's just uh, com complicated. It, it, it's it's just an alternate way of doing it, and they show you down there. Why, why would people want to use just that? Using their names. Honestly. Well, I I mean, yeah, obviously, because it makes more human sense. But why would anybody use? Well, so the, the, the PASM aside, why would anybody use? I'll, like, I'll answer the, you. Uh, any any time that they give you the ability to use a number instead of you know, a, a list of things that are accessible in the same place with an index number of them mm -hmm. allows you to access them with an algorithm from one line instead of multiple lines. So you can have a, you know, a repeat index from zero to how many registers were there? 
15, 16. 60. So 0 through 15. Oh, yeah, 16. Repeat uh, index from 0 to 15. And then your, what is it, SPR? Right. Uh huh. And then, you know, is it a bracket in this case? Yeah, same thing. And you're bracket using a bracket backwards. index, okay? And then, you know, you're, if you use a case statement, you can go through each one of them, you know, and depending on which one you're on, it can do a different thing on each iteration of the loop. Right. Another example is you could write code that could work with counter A or counter B, and then you could pass it in a, a number zero or one, and then use the SPR uh, access mechanism to access the counter A, frequency A, and phase A registers, or if, but you're accessing with SPR, but then you could also add in your passed in parameter, which is a zero or one which would cause it to then access, if it's a one, it will access counter B instead of counter A. So basically what it boils down to is that you can design it uh, so that uh, your algorithm that's doing whatever you're doing is more flexible and responsive to different types of situations. The less and less it's hard-coded, the more and more flexibility is possible. crickets and i leave that to you guys okay <laughs> i will use it's, kind it's of an pre usage that... i will use its predefined name no problem <laughs> yeah most most code i've seen in spin just uses the the name of the actual registers gotcha uh, it's really uncommon to use the spr okay. notation okay and hopefully roy and i just inspired somebody to to, to use the thing. The poor guy never gets his his uh <laughs> his time in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Uh hub. Hub hub hub. To maintain system integrity, mutually exclusive resources must not be accessed by more than one cog at a time. Because uh, it's not capable of it. <laughs> right. It controls access to mutually exclusive, giving each cog a turn, round robin fashion. Um, at half the system clock rate, right? So it gives cog access. Okay, this means that the hub gives a cog access to mutually exclusive resources once every sixteen system clock cycles. Right. Once every. So each cog will get access to the hub once every sixteen cycles. So it so takes there's... two clock cycles per ho uh, per cog, because there are eight cogs. Well, it's you shouldn't really think of it that way. Just think of it as the when the hub is on cog zero mm -hmm. and then moves off, it will be back to cog zero sixteen clocks later. Okay. Um, and and the reason why you shouldn't really think of it as it takes two clocks is because it's not really taking two clocks. It's more like uh. The that cog is given access every sixteen clock cycles, and if it doesn't do anything, it'll just go on to the next cog. And if it does something, it'll actually interact with the hub then and issue a command, and the hub will operate. And but only the, for one long, long, for one long's worth of passing back and forth, or um, you know, there's all these other commands that get issued here. There's cog, cog new. Cog that would still it, have to be. We talked about all of this stuff cycles. before. I mean, that would still have to be yes. within two system clock cycles, though. Well, Everything it's... happens in one, really. I mean, that there's like stop and go, stop and go kinds of stuff that make it uh, to your code seem like it takes longer, but literally everything happens in one clock cycle. Sometimes it just takes more than one uh, <laughs> hub go round. <laughs> To, to make it really happen, right? Because it's more complicated than what a 32-bit processor can do in one step, right? Okay. Like, you, you literally, a long is 32 bits, and literally the cog has 32 bits that it can send to the hub and back. Remember, we were talking about um, uh, a couple weeks ago how uh, uh, when that hub is turning around, it checks the 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 electrical bits on a cog to see if there was a cog new or anything like that. Yeah, that's you know related to what you're you're asking here. 
Well, I know. Right. And if you get to the top of the very next page, it has a little graph showing the system clock versus the hub clock and versus the cogs having access to hub. And it's kind of a, com it looks complicated, but it's not really that bad. So at the, across the top there, you've got your system clock going by. So it is two clock Zero. cycles. Ha. Right. So a hub clock is two clock cycles per two system clock cycles per one of its clock cycles. Um, and it's, uh, you know, two, two cycles go by before it gets to the next hub, the next cog having access to the hub. But if you'll notice, uh, cog zero is actually operating on the hub for up to eight clock cycles because that's how long those instructions take. So right? how does it do that if it doesn't have access to it? Well, it it's a little bit complicated, but what happens is is that it initiates the command and says, okay, I want to read memory. Okay. But um the result isn't given back to it until eight clocks later. Do you remember when we, like I was just saying, how that when the hub gets around and it checks the cog to see what the cog is asking to do, the yeah. cog just sits there after it's sent that, you know, it doesn't really send it, it turns on, you know, these 32 switches, right? Yeah. Some of them. That's how it talks to the, you know, the, the hub. It turns them on. The hub sees that when it comes around, and then it starts doing that job. Right. And then when it's done, it, you know, tells that cog that I'm done. Here's what you asked for. I see. Right. So it might and, take. And your table right there is showing you how long that actually takes to do. Right. And so, you know, even though you issued on clock zero, hub you know, the cog zero issued a command to the hub. And uh, that's what HI is hub instruction is what that's saying there on that uh, little graph. Yep. So um, it's issued a hub instruction and it's the hub instruction starts going and then the, the hub access window moves along and two clocks later it gets to cog one and cog one in this case doesn't do anything, uh, doesn't start anything happening. But so okay, the, let me in the background hub the cog zero hub instruction is still executing. And right. Eventually it okay. gets done eight clocks later and the result is available for cog zero. Right. So cogs can initiate instructions that run in the background of the hub even though the hub is moving from cog to cog. Right. And, and when the cog is the background is is a loose term, but that's close enough to yeah. not okay. matter. Yeah. Okay. I I I would have to ask Chip for details, but I as I've said on the show before, I'm assuming that there's dedicated uh, circuitry for every single one of the cogs in that hub to do all of those jobs. And yeah. that's why it can do eight of them at the same time. It what All it's taking turns on doing is going around and saying, what do you need? Okay, now what do you need? Okay, now what do you need? But each one of them internally in the hub has its own copy of... Well, the hub's like a nurse. Yeah, basically. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I I, w I wouldn't say it's a full copy. I would say some portion of it is yeah. unique to each cog, and then the the part that's actually doing the final step of like okay, loading up the RAM into the cogs bus or whatever is where you end up with it's only got one of those, but the window for that cog is where it sticks that in. So to close that up because we're out of time here. Um... Addy, the main thing to take away from that is that uh, when you're asking to do a, uh, in a cog, you're asking to do uh, a hub instruction like that, yep. your code is going to pause while it waits for the answer. Okay. Right. And so. all of this is uh, somewhat uh, meaningless to spin because we don't even really care. This is mostly for PASM. Maybe you should be first PASM. Well, you know, they're they're related. I, they're part I see, of the I same thing. I seem to be thing. asking more questions about it. <laughs> it's just helpful to know what this is going on under the covers. Right. That's all. Right. All right. Uh, that's it for us for this week. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, uh, next week, we're all going to learn binary and hexadecimal. No. Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to do some homework, do that. Uh, you can get this show every week on Tuesday at first spin dot tv yep yep 
Bye. Bye. See ya.